the Wauwatosa School Board. And as is our custom, we'll begin with a moment of silent reflection. Mrs. Galante, would you call the roll? Mr. Croner? Here. Mr. Meyer? Here. Mrs. Milfeld? Here. Mrs. Randall? Here. Mr. Ray? Here. Mrs. Weber? Here. Mrs. Fee? Here. We begin our meetings with an opportunity for public comment on non-agenda items. If there's anyone present who would like to make a uh, comment on an item not on tonight's agenda, please approach the microphone and state your name and address prior to making your comment. <laughs> Seeing none, we will move forward with approval of the consent agenda. Mm -hmm. Are there any items on the consent agenda which board members would like to remove for separate discussion or action? Seeing none, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Is there any community comment on the consent agenda? Mrs. Gonti, would you call the roll? Mr. Croner? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Mrs. Milfeld? Yes. Mrs. Randall? Yes. <coughs> Mr. Ray? Yes. Mrs. Weber? Yes. Mrs. Fee? Yes. That brings us to recognitions. Mr. Croner? Thank you. Wauwatosa School District has been named to the AP Achievement List by the College Board for significant gains in advanced placement access and student performance. The district is one of fewer than 400 school districts in the nation being honored by the College Board with a place on its AP achievement list for opening AP classroom doors to a significantly broader pool of students while maintaining or improving the percentage of students earning scores of three or higher. From 2008 to 2010, Wauwatosa School District has increased the number of students participating in AP classes from 295 to 330 while improving the percentage of students earning AP exam scores of three or higher, the score typically needed to earn college credit from 75% in 2008 to 79% in 2010. The AP Achievement List includes 388 school districts representing 43 states that are simultaneously expanding opportunities and improving performance. Wauwatosa West High School sophomore Gina Richer has been awarded an all-expense paid summer study trip to the Federal Republic of Germany by the American Association of Teachers of German or AATG. Gina was one of approximately 23,000 students who competed for the study trip by participating in the nationwide German testing program administered by the AATG. Gina is one of 39 students selected to receive this prestigious award. The study trip awards have been made possible annually for over 50 years by a grant from the Federal Republic of Germany through its embassy in Washington, D.C. The AATG is dedicated to the advancement and improvement of teaching language, literature, and culture of German-speaking countries. Karen Aoi is the German teacher at Wauwatosa West. McKinley Elementary Library Media Specialist Carol Sergis has been selected to participate in the 2011 Fulbright Hayes Seminars Abroad Program to Greece and Turkey. The U.S. Department of Education's Fulbright Hayes Abroad Program is administered by International and Foreign Language Education Office of Post-Secondary Education in cooperation with the Fulbright Commission, U.S. Department of State. The aim of this seminar is to offer a unique experience of professional and personal enrichment to its participants leading to a better understanding of the two countries' histories, cultures, and peoples, and thus acting as a forum for the development of new international educational projects and collaborations. The Fulbright Hayes Seminars Abroad Program provides opportunities for overseas experience. The program is open to educators and administrators with responsibilities for curriculum development in fields related to humanities, languages, and area studies. Topics and host countries of the seminars vary from year to year. Three East High School musicians have been named scholarship recipients by Unlimited Jazz of Greater Milwaukee. Sophomores Peter Garofalo, a jazz pianist in Jazz One, and Nick Mace, a drummer in Jazz Two, were each named recipients of $500 scholarships. Sophomore Leonard Simpson, lead alto player in Jazz Two, 
and leader of the O Jazz Group at East High School, was named the recipient of the $1,000 Douglas Gmoser Award. Unlimited Jazz of Greater Milwaukee held its jazz scholarship auditions recently. The auditions were open to students from throughout southeastern Wisconsin. Jazz Unlimited Awards <coughs> deserving students in grades 7 through 12 with jazz camp and lesson scholarships to further their jazz education. Students from Wauwatosa East and West High Schools recently took part in the American Association of Teachers of German, AATG, National German Examination. Wauwatosa students were among the 26,000 German students nationwide to participate in the test. Students scoring above the 90th percentile <coughs> from East High School and who qualified to apply for a study trip to Germany are Hannah Dion Kishner, Molly Nellen, Trevor Howard, Sarah Spanger, Sarah Armstrong, Rose Spice Kopischke, and Evan Howard. West students who performed above the 90th percentile are Vanessa Winfrey, Gina Richter, Sullivan Boyd, Christopher Trojan, Caitlin Hembrook, Benjamin Hadjaradik, uh, Andrew Awe, and Alex Figueroa. Students who scored in the 85th percentile or above include Carl Belmer, Margaret Smith, and Julia Bielke from East High School, and Dana Kautzer and Hannah Wolfgram from West High School. These students will attend a spring awards ceremony and be eligible to win monetary and book awards. Students scoring in the 70th percentile or above are Jordan Schnell, Pia Schnell, Austin Kautzer, Sam McNaughton, Zach Soderberg, Ian Mathias, Alex Sukupchik, Ashley Lindstrom, Harrison Fangman, Ron Brown, and Andrew Gates from West High School. East High School students who receive certificates of merit include Lydia Hartman Kaiser, Claire Ducanto, Kyle Maybe, Nola McDonald, Sarah Spry, Clayton Risto, John Petch, Mitchell Thomas, and Christian Siebert. Eva Tunstra is the German teacher at East High School, and Karen Alwe is the German teacher at West High School. <clears throat> West High School social studies teacher Mary Johnston has been awarded a $1,000 grant from the Teachers for Global Classrooms, TGC, Alumni Small Grants Program. The TGC Small Grants Program provides grants to secondary school teachers who are alumni of the U.S. Teachers Exchange component of the teaching. Excellence and Achievement Program and the International Leaders in Education Program. Grants are issued to support projects, materials, and activities that will infuse a global perspective into alumni classrooms. TGC is a program of the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs of the U.S. Department of State. Three teams from the district are advancing to the Destination Imagination State Tournament, which will be held April 16th on the University of Wisconsin Stephen Point campus. East High School, Longfellow Middle School, and Wilson Elementary Wauwatosa STEM teams will go on to the state tournament. The Longfellow and Wilson Wauwatosa STEM teams advanced with second place finishes in the mytholo <laughs> Mythology Mission Challenge. Longfellow placed in the secondary level and Wilson Wauwatosa STEM placed in the elementary level of the challenge. Teams taking part in the Mythology Mission Challenge were required to create a five-minute improvisational skit about a mission involving a mythical creature. The focus of the challenge was on research and understanding of cultures, mythology, improvisational acting, story development, theater arts, and teamwork. East High School's team finished second in the Versus Foiled Again Challenge. Teams taking part in this challenge were required to design and build a structure made only of aluminum foil, wood, and glue and test how much weight the structure would hold. The focus of the challenge was architectural design, structural engineering, construction, material science, research, innovation, and design process, mathematics, theater arts, poetry, and teamwork. Destination Imagination is a creative problem-solving program for students in kindergarten through college. Destination Imagination teaches problem-solving strategies, teamwork, and lifelong skills. Teams must brainstorm their solutions to one of five challenges 
then build and present them on their own. East High School honored 53 student achievers at the 18th Annual Achievers Breakfast on April 7. The breakfast salutes those students who have shown marked improvement during their school career and honors them, not for what they have achieved, but rather how they have achieved it. Freshman recipients were Lakeisha Harris, Haley Cron, Joseph Lacey, Cassandra Lamb, Aaron Martin, Megan Milan, Samuel Mintner, Joseph Olenichuk, and Sierra Rodell McGrew. Sophomore first year recipients were Testa Kristen, Joseph Firestein, Bobby Joe Gibbs, Richard Gomez, Connor Healy, Kathleen Kerber, Jaleel King, Adrian Cosmeter, John Murphy, Samantha Nitschke, Deshaun Reynolds, Sarah Spry, Lucas Tietzen, and Javon Williams. Sophomore second year recipients were Michael Leffler, Manet Simpson, Claire, Claire, Sherry, Claire Sherry Thornton. Junior first year recipients were Travis Booten, Daryl Bowie, Christopher Greer, Raven Cook, Taylor Lewis, Jacob Meyer, Tiara Morgan, Nami Morgenstar, Robert Russ, Isabel Utschig, and Alexandra Williamson. The junior second year recipient was Deara Starks. Senior first year recipients were Katerina Vandemuel, Isabel Cartier, Ashley Corlett, Brandon Ernie, Gerard Gorlick, Brittany Gottschalk, Ryan Reagan, Rachel Schultz, Nathan, Nathan Spildy, and Ryder Todd. Second year, senior second year recipients were by Andre Anderson, Juliana Gutwin, Daniel Leffler, James Nolan, and Jeffrey Shank. Thank you to uh, my colleagues for reading all of those names. <laughs> And congratulations to each of the students and staff members mentioned. The fact that we have this many recognitions speaks uh, to the quality of the, of the students and the staff that we have and the hard work that everyone puts forward across a variety of areas. We see academic, musical, and extracurricular, and uh, it's fantastic to have this many recognitions. So congratulations to each of you. Our next... Yes. I'd like to commend the Wauwatosa East High School Raider um, Theater Group that presented Fiddler on, excuse me, one they did a number of years ago, Phantom of the Opera. It was a superb production. It was last weekend and it will be again this weekend, Monday, excuse me, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And I would encourage anyone who has not seen it to try to see it. it, it you will be amazed at these young people and what they presented to the audience. Thank you. Before we move on, is there anything further? Then we will move to reports to the board and we'll begin with student learning. Mr. Anderson. Good evening. And it's an honor to be here tonight. I know that um, I saw the uh, agenda being um, Quite full. I'll try to keep my presentation under an hour. So. <laughs> well, I think it was back in early winter that the board requested a little bit more information on 21st century learning and 21st century skills. So I'm here tonight to give you a little bit more information on uh, those on this topic. So as we look at 21st century learning, we have to kind of go back and just take a look at 20th century learning. And when we do that, um, just to bring to your attention that the focus of our teaching was on core subjects and assessing those core subjects. It was really about if we could do that really well, that we would really create a well-rounded citizen and somebody that could really contribute to our community. So what has changed with 21st century learning really the emphasis has changed where there's specific skills that are kind of out front, where the core subjects become embedded within those skills. And so in this diagram, what you'll see is um, 
21st century assessment, which is more authentic assessment, um, assessment of actual completion of work. Uh, may it be a project, uh, may it be um, an actual um, creation of, um, such as DI, of a, um, a task. And also in there, there is life and career skills in red. There's also learning and innovation skills, and that would be in uh, gold. And then a core subject areas, and then we'll talk a little bit about um, those learning skills in pink and salmon. They're kind of embedded around that, that model. So why did this shift happen between the core being at the front, the content, and now kind of skills being there with the, with the core content being embedded? Well, that why that we look at 21st century skills is really about um, the World Wide Web. And 15 years ago in 1996, there was approximately 45 million global users of the World Wide Web. There was about 25,000 sites available where information could be um, accessed. Now, access, of course, at that time was fairly new, so most of the published <coughs> material that you see on the web at that time was from research institutions and universities. There was very little um, in terms of user-generated content, but it was a way to, it was a new way to access information. Flip that over 10 years later, um, and in 2006, approximately 1 billion global users and about 80 billion websites. The published content from research and universities, the breadth of that has grown, but something new has happened. And what new has happened is that our, our users are actually beginning to generate content. So they're playing a role in uh, what we see this thing called collective intelligence. And as Jamie has mentioned a number of times as he's come to the board, that cloud, well, that's kind of that shout out to, to Jamie. The, uh, the cloud is really that, that interactive intelligent um, space that's created by Web 2.0. So here's just a, a quick example. The number of words in the English language is approximately 1,009,614. This is estimated from the Global Language Monitor on March 21st of 2011. In 1900, there was, there was just over half a million words. But now again, that number continues to grow and grow. Eng the English language passed that million word threshold June 10th, 2009 at 10.22 a.m. Greenwich Mean Time. That millionth word was Web 2.0. So look at it as currently there's approximately 98 minutes, or excuse me, a new word created every 98 minutes and 14.7 words created per day. Now, I kind of remember back to my uh, grade school days when I was getting my spelling list and I'd have to learn my list. Well, if uh, our English language continues to grow as it is, um, again, knowing the foundation of those spelling words, that hasn't gone away. It's still there. Um, so when we talk about 21st century skills, it's nothing different than not what we're currently doing, but it's about how we're emphasizing what we do with the knowledge that we're learning. So we know that today's learners are different. They possess um, information that's fundamentally different. They process and they think differently than we do. The, they're really this, this, our kids coming into school now are really the first generation of data, data, our data natives, or digital natives, excuse me. And you and I, we're all data um, digital uh, immigrants because we didn't grow up. We've kind of learned how as the technology comes out, we adapt to it and we learn. Well, it's kind of already there. My son's a great example. He, is, he has a phone, he has access to information. We have the World Wide Web. He's got a computer. Um, multimedia, he has access to gaming and all those things. Um, again, what, what that does is it is changed the pattern of thinking. And brain research has shown that these patterns have affected how uh, students are excited about learning, engaged in learning. And so that does have some ramifications as to um, 
how we evolve as uh, education in education. So here just is a way of information options, and it's a little bit hard to see. Um, all the myriad of, of information options that our students have at their fingertips. Social networks, Facebook, you may have heard of that. YouTube, video streaming, blogs, um, pictures, Flickr. Um, these are just, just t touching the iceberg of Web 2.0. And again, as I mentioned earlier, these particular avenues um, allow us, the user, to begin to create the content. So it's not just about, you know, somebody in the past would create the content and deliver it. Now we're actually, as users, having the opportunity to add to that comment. It's just uh, uh, Dr. Ertl. Dr. Ertl puts a blog out weekly. And so he adds to the information. Um, he does these things to, again, continue to add to the knowledge base um, for our district. So let's look at the paradigm. The shifts are from a very heavily lectured um, type of classroom to more of a teacher being the facilitator. They have to be very highly skilled to do that. Um, students access information in the past in the 20th century. They'd access that information at school. They'd tag, take in that information. And then at home, they would be provided homework practice and so on and so forth. Now, our students today have access 24-7, anytime, anywhere. And some people would argue that actually when they come to school, they have less access. But that's the, the old adage that at home they have all their bells and whistles, and again, at school they don't have all their bells and whistles, like video games and you name it. Um, in, in the old model, we had rows and desks, very isolated learning. Um, now we have clusters. We're talking about um, tables interaction, opportunities to share. Where we looked at individual performance in the past, um, we still look at individual performance, but it becomes more group and team performance. Um, our teachers engage students in learning in the old model, and teachers were kind of the dispensers of knowledge. And now technology is used to engage the students in learning. And technology provides that, that access to that knowledge and that pathway. So we go from that content driven to that content skills and themes becomes important. And finally, at the bottom, it kind of looks at the old you know, textbooks where the, the textbook publishers were the gatekeepers of what knowledge came out, particularly the big states, such as California um, and Texas, because that's where all the, they would go there for the market and they'd say, what content do you want? And, all the smaller states would then buy into that. But now it's really the curriculum is fluid. The, the standards and benchmarks remain constant, but the curriculum itself becomes fluid to meet individual learners' needs. Because one of the things that we talk about is how do we begin to individualize learning for each student? So coming full circle, 21st century skills, really looking at the core subjects, 21st century themes, um, learning skills and innovation, information technology and media, and then life and career skills. These all play a role in the, the current curriculum. So those core subjects as defined by 21st century learning, we want well-rounded students uh, across a myriad of core subject areas from geography to mathematics to science to English. It's no different than what we you know, are developing our students in as well-rounded in Wauwatosa. But the exposure to those core areas is exposing them, but it's what we want them to do with that information. So in the past, it was learn the information, we're going to assess you, and we feel good about it. Now it's learn the information, now what are you going to do with it? So some of, the, um, some of the skills that run across the different core content areas of, let's say, um, I'm in science. And one of the things that I do is I know I have my core science content to teach, let's say in earth science, per se. Well, I know that in, that, in my efforts, I have to include global awareness, civic engagement, um, business, financial, and economic economic literacy. 
So I have to take those bigger, broader themes and help to take the content and make it more diverse for all of our, all of our learners so that students at the local level understand how a science concept impacts the local, the state, the national, and the global, what ramifications that they have. In terms of learning skills, you'll see this repeated. It's kind of, it's a more of a spiral. It loops through, but it's about critical thinking, problem solving. How do we communicate? How do we begin to help self-direct learning? How do we empower our students to be hungry for more and new knowledge? Um, it is about information and media literacy and about accountability and adaptability. And finally, um, it is about social responsibility. So part of what I talked about earlier in that model was that career and life skills. And we are looking at leadership, ethics, accountability, productivity, people skills, all those things. But what we're trying to do is build that through a child's career. In other words, we're not waiting till 12, uh, till a senior and say, we're gonna have a conversation. So what do you wanna do next? What we're saying is, we know there's an end in mind, and that's graduation from Wauwatosa Public Schools. So what are we doing to plant the seeds, to look at the goals that our students have for aspirations after what's the next step? And so those are the things that, again, that 21st century is saying we need to continue to build and focus on. So we talked a little bit about the area in red, which is life and career. We talked about the gold section, the learning and innovation, the core subject areas. We're gonna talk, we talked a little bit about the learning and skills, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. But we'll, we'll look at um, a little bit about the 21st century tools and um, ITC. So we know that in 21st century, that thinking and learning are very critical. And we want to build that critical learning, that critical thinking and problem solving skill. And when we think of how we're trying to take kids in um, Bloom's taxonomy, we want them to, we say, we want to build rigor in our curriculum. And what the rigor means is, okay, now that you've learned something, now I want you to synthesize, analyze, create, and take that information to a whole new level. And that's where that innovation, how to cl collaborate and communicate, where all those pieces come together. So it's not as one thing as an isolation, but they're um, intertwined. So when we look at Bloom's taxonomy, the old version, and we'll talk about the updated version, we ended up with knowledge at the bottom. And as you move up the scale, you talk about more complexity of thinking. And so the complexity as you um, go up the ladder, what we've revised it to look like is to say, okay, knowledge. Well, what do you remember? Okay, that's very low level you know, information and learning. Comprehension, we know that's important because, okay, now do you understand? The application to that is now take some of that and apply it. It doesn't mean you've learned it yet, but you've applied it. And what we're saying is now take it and do some analysis. Be more complex with a number of different um, learning and apply it across contexts. So take some math, take some science, integrate them and learn across those disciplines. And then we talk about evaluation and synthesis, which is really about creating. So the top three things of create, evaluate, and analyze, those are all intertwined within our common core English language arts, um, standards and benchmarks, or standards, and also in the math. Um, they are soon coming out with science, um, and that should be coming out sometime this year. So what is this thing called information, communication, technology, and literacy? Well, it's really the ability to use technology to accomplish thinking and learning skills through the use of information media. In other words, let me give you an example. Think of technology as a tool or a means. And so if we allow students to create, evaluate, and analyze, again, higher order thinking, um, what we have to do is provide them that avenue. So the means might be, and let's take another, let's take a, another science, um, science situation where 
we have a graphic information system. Now, a graphic information system, or GIS, is, is a software. It's a means. And so in science, we could say, I want to look at population. I want to look at faults and earthquakes and their occurrence. And then I want to look at um, floods, uh, floodplains. And we can get that data out on the web. It's available. We download that data, put it into this tool, and it creates maps of the information we've asked to create. Now what students can do is take those layers of information and begin to analyze, make some predictions. And so if there was another large earthquake and a tsunami in J Japan, what might happen? So that's what we talk about when we talk about communication, literacy, and technology, or ITC. So when we look at Wauwatosa students as they graduate, this is kind of a take on um, late night show hosts top 10. Um, here are the things we want our students to graduate with, the qualities. Financial and economic literacy. We've really, we've, we've set forth um, in our uh, graduation standards that all students will have a half credit of financial literacy. It's important to us. But that doesn't mean that it stops there. Those are pieces that need to be intertwined within all the other disciplines. Civically, we want students to be civically engaged. We want them to know more about the community in which they reside. And so that's part of, what, of our efforts in 21st century learning is to get kids engaged to know that, yes, you're learning things in the classroom. But what implications does it have outside of classroom doors, right beyond our, our walls. Global awareness, we want our students to be globally aware. I mean, we saw the World Wide Web, we have connections. No longer do we have a classroom where we cannot access um, information or a classroom in, let's say, Japan. Let's say, um, Germany. These are at our fingertips. We want our kids to be globally aware, to know that what they do has an impact on the world. Information and media literacy. We want them to be able to, again, take information in different forms. And again, they're digital natives. So all that information they like to see, and it is more visual, take it and use it to, again, apply it to um, making your community or um, community better. We want learners to be self-directed. We want them to be able to know what their strengths and weaknesses are, uh, what their assets are as they leave our, um, our doors onto bigger and better things in life. Number five, effective collaborators. Not only are we working on that with our teachers, we're also working on these things for our students. We want them to be effective communicators, um, again, part of our curriculum is to have um, that um, speech class that's in, intertwined in their education, but it goes beyond just that course. Um, we're doing more things in the classroom that get students more effective in terms of delivering what they've learned to other students and how they communicate that. We want them to be innovative. Part of um, project Lead the Way and our middle school program is to create students in more of a project-based learning environment that creates innovation, that stimulates thinking, that creates that collaboration. We want them to solve mm -hmm. problems. DI, those kids in DI, they solve problems. We want our students to be able to solve problems and be able to apply what they know to, to solutions uh, not only in their local schools, also their local community and again in their state and globally. And finally, critical thinkers. What that means is we want them to be able to think, listen, take in information, pause, and again, step up and say, this is what I think based upon everything I've learned. So I have a short uh, video clip here that really I think it, it talks about technology, but what it does is it sets the stage for where we are and where we're moving as a society. So I think it's really important for us to focus on an education that 
as fast as things are moving forward outside our buildings, they're moving forward with our kids. Let's see if this works. If it doesn't, well. 20th century skills. 20th century. <laughs> Rule number one, know your equipment. <laughs> or be smarter than your equipment. Yeah. Education was ranked number 55, the lowest, below coal mining. Sorry. There we go. For the last hundred years, we've used the industrial narrative. That schools are like factories. It's an administrative process. It's about control and order. The kids are having a much more stimulating and rich environment outside of schools than they are in school. Kids are very rich content developers today through their social networking sites. They're big communicators through email, instant messaging, and text messaging. And yet all of those things are banned from their schools. Every turned off device is potentially a turned off child. We have to accept as educators that technology is not really a choice. It has created a world. It's just not here to help you teach traditional subjects. It has invented has emerged a completely new environment. It's about relationship, it's about community, it's about connectivity, it's about access. Children are living now in a, in a, in a different space. They're living in what, what I call uh, nearly now. And nearly now is that space that they text in, that space that they update their Facebook entries in, the space that they um, Twitter in, you know, the space that, that is not quite synchronous. Now, it's a really interesting space because it's not adversarial, it's not pressured. It's a space where people can, it's all the artworks, they can reflect and retract and research and, uh, and repeat, you know, and it's a very, it's a very gentle world. I'll tell you what, it's a great world for learning. If I could remodel a classroom of today, I, I'm not sure it would be a bricks and mortar classroom. So the student is at the center and school is just one of the ways and places that they learn, but they also learn through community, at home, in museums, in libraries, and of course, online. It's about providing the best quality teachers no matter where a student lives and making those bridges. It's wandering around the city with their cell phones and collecting data that kids will be doing outside of school. School might be the place where you come together to do joint projects, uh, where you social network, where you do some of the other kinds of enrichment things. And we've got a classroom system when we could have a community system. It's about opening the door to NASA resources to the labs that are being developed online at MIT and connecting these students to the kinds of opportunities that will fundamentally shift their academic experience and make them better prepared not only for college but for life. You start with the teacher. If I want my students to be making global connections, then I'm going to give the tools to my teachers first and provide them with opportunities to connect with other teachers around the world or other teachers around the country. The task here is to give teachers a place where they can swap authentic ingredients and their evidence of those ingredients is safe and tested. Do you know that doesn't exist anywhere in the world? I've just been part of a, a big project that I think is going to change that and change that radically. We have to develop a narrative that sustains 21st century learning. If we simply apply standards, if we simply have a, a steady regime of standardized testing, that will make things better. When in fact, it is economically actually a foolish idea because the jobs that these kids in school will be having <coughs> do not call for this kind of right answer vending machine approach. Life No Child uh, Left Behind fades away, it enables local creativity and innovations. They will be doing work that calls on their artistic abilities, that calls on their abilities of synthesis, that calls on their abilities of understanding the context, that calls on their abilities of working in teams, that calls on their abilities in some sense to be multidisciplinary, multilingual, multicultural. So the coin of the realm is not memorizing the facts that they're going to need to know for the rest of their lives. The coin of the realm will be, do you know how to find information? Do you know how to validate it? Do you know how to synthesize it? Do you know how to leverage it? Do you know how to communicate it? Do you know how to collaborate with it? Do you know how to problem solve with it? That's the new 21st century set of literacies. And it looks a lot different than the model that most of us were raised under. Now we're looking at a whole different range of schools. We're looking at schools that are producing genius, collaborative, gregarious, uh, brave children uh, who care about stuff like their culture. And the building
build schools that do that is a whole another challenge. And around the world, you know, people are testing out the ingredients of what makes that work. And those ingredients are being assembled into some just stunning recipes in different places. It's a very exciting type of learning. It's the death of education, but it's the dawn of learning that makes me very happy. I think it was interesting, uh, the last comment, the death of education, but the birth of learning. Um, I think that's very true. Um, we have been having a conversation probably for the last five years about changing the whole focus of this district from our kids, what are we teaching kids to, what are our kids learning? Um, we've created a backbone of fiber optics to enable us to get to that next level. We're looking at elementary world language to foster the love of culture and to produce um, bilingual students. Um, these are all efforts that we're doing to get our kids ready for 21st century. It's not all that we're doing, but those are just some um, explanations of what we're doing. So we're on the right path. Um, it's, it's never ending, um, but I think we're in a good place. And, Good place is good to be. Questions? Mr. Meyer? <clears throat> where where are, the, are the philosophers and the artists? I, I, I read through the materials and the sponsors are predominantly tech companies and it's very much a tech focus. And I really like tech. I earn my living in tech. But if a child does not read Plato in high school and does not sing Bach in high school, that child as an adult probably never will ever again. Even if you do it in high school, you probably won't do it ever again. So there's some things we need to hold on to with the arts and the philosophies and they don't have a lot to do with technology. I know technology is the vehicle for a lot, but um, some things need to be slowly enjoyed. Yeah, well, I would agree. I mean, just when we talk about 21st century learning, it doesn't mean that it's an all or nothing. And so you're absolutely right. Um, how do we stimulate creativity, um, the arts, music? Um, those play an important role in the development of our kids. And they're an embedded piece within our community. So. It's not saying that those don't have a place. Um, what I'm saying is that, you know, music may have, maybe we can have smaller groups doing more things online with music. Um, there's a great video that there's a composer who um, recently graduated with his doctorate, and he decided he wrote a piece, and he wrote a piece and he published it. And what he said is he put a little blurb on YouTube and he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to conduct. And so what I'd like everybody to do is send me your rendition of my song in alto, bass, tenor. And so they all did. They sent them all these clips. And he put them together and he created a choir. So it's a shift in thinking. It allows more community to participate in those opportunities. And that's where we have to continue to emphasize with our kids that, yes, Arts and these things and music are very important to their development. There's other ways we can get to it, but they're all important. Anything further, Mr. Meyer? Mr. Croner? Thank you. That was a really good explanation. I know we've thrown that term around 21st century skills a lot, and I think I have a much clearer understanding of what it means, and especially what it means in our district. What I was thinking about as I watched your presentations, I was exposed to all of these ideas, but not until I was in graduate school. And so I see now that the goal is to bring that kind of training that you might not receive unless you're in graduate school down to the college level and down to the school, the high school level. So my question is, in doing that, if it's, it's the 21st century, but we have 20th century teachers, you know, digital immigrants. So what is the district doing? How are we doing with bringing teachers along to teach critical thinking skills and collaboration and things like that in the classrooms and how are we ensuring that that's taking place? I know it's, if you're not, have been trained in that area, it's hard skill to learn. How are we bringing the teachers along, you know, to teach these skills? 
Well, I think it's it's definitely an area that we could grow. Um, I think that we're with our district teacher leaders and some of the restructuring we've done. Um, we're trying to address some of those angles. Um, if there was a quick fix out there to get native or non-digital natives to, you know, learn, we'd be we'd be doing it. So. We do have a lot of individuals who are using technology in their classrooms. And what we're trying to do is exploit those people to be greater leaders within their buildings to share their practices around some of the current things that we're doing. So it's more of a you know, teacher leader model that we're trying to develop, taking some of the younger teachers to share what they're doing with some of the older teachers who um, aren't that digital native. It's not a perfect model, but we're, we're at least starting that process. I'm just going to add to that as well. Um, the critical thinking that you brought up, that's part of the initiative that we have when we did our English language arts review. When we um, sent our teachers for training with advanced placement at the eighth grade level, and then this summer our seventh grade teachers are going to go. And that is... Um, a lot of that critical thinking and the kinds of things we're talking about, even as, as advanced placement has revised their curriculum to align more to the critical thinking that we're talking about here, that's part of that training that they're receiving so that we have individuals in the building that understand um, what that looks in application. And feedback on that has been very good, that teachers have, much, have a much better understanding of how to apply rigor in the classroom. Um, so that's, that's one way that we've been doing that. The other way, too, is having our teachers experience some technology. Um, we just offer, you know, like our smart board trainings, trying to get them to really understand not just how to use it as a, um, a high, a kind of a nice chalkboard, but that it actually can enhance their instruction and you can create with it and do some of those higher order thinking um, things with it as well. So we've offered training for that and that's part of where we've looked to introduce our teachers as well too, like the iPad. But the critical thinking is the one that I think we focus on the most. I also want to add that with every curriculum, as we have um, been redoing standards and benchmarks, we added a skill component in so that we're not just talking about content standards and benchmarks, but we're also talking about more enduring skills that we would expect across those curricular areas. And that's forced teachers to have some really good conversations about what those are. So we're, in, we're trying to embed it in some of the practices that we're doing with our curriculum. It's an interesting and challenging problem because I know from my professional career, you, know, you, you, you can be really creative and innovative, but if you don't have the content area down, that doesn't help you. And you, if you know all the content, but you're not creative and innovative, you're not very useful either. And trying to, to get the right blend of both is a big challenge. And getting the teachers to know how to do the right blend of both is, is a good challenge. And I'm glad to see we're thinking along those lines. And as we uh, begin to next year address science, um, again, these pieces are going to be intertwined within the process of reviewing our curriculum and what we want it to look like in the 21st century. Yes, Mrs. Mary Randall, jo? Just to continue on that, I think um, what's encouraging and really interesting is um, teachers themselves and why they're teachers and um, how all of this fits into their motivation for what they do. I, I tell you about a third grade teacher at Jefferson all the time who's amazing. Um, Mr. Price, you probably know. Yes. Um, yeah. She had technology in her classroom many years ago. She piloted the, um, the cameras and, but you know, she had the kids at the tables and very, um, unusual things for that time but those you walk in that room and it was learning 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 it was excitement it was acceptance um, and I think you know when especially right now when there's so much conversation about teachers um, you know given the political climate and the fiscal climate um, that yeah, we, you know, they do have to learn learn to do some of this, but I think for most of our very good teachers, it's in their nature to seek that out and, and to take advantage of the opportunities that I think 
our administration has done very well in um, bringing to them. But um, yeah, it's exciting. Walk in class yeah. and you see traditional stuff going on and you see fun new things coming in and going on, but um, it's a lot about the people. And, I, and again, I refer back to, and I think you mentioned it too, it's about, it's about learning. Mm -hmm. I think we've really changed that conversation to focus on learning mm -hmm. um, and learning for our students and mm -hmm. what they're learning. And, and again, it comes back to really good teachers mm -hmm. and job embedded staff development. Mm -hmm. People doing what, what they were meant well. to do. Any other board member questions or comments? Mr. Meyer? Well, just to be clear, I don't see so far that you, I mean, it's all good stuff. But you haven't talked content. You haven't talked philosophies. You haven't talked philosophers. You um, haven't, there's much that's not here. So there's much that is so far undecided in the board's assessment about what you're doing. The board may say tonight it likes what it's seen, but the board hasn't seen much of substance yet on which to make a decision. We don't know if we have the classic philosophers. We don't know whether we have the Eastern philosophers, the Greeks, um, you, know, the, you know, the great artists, the um, you know art, artist scientists from you know from various ages. We don't know whether we have those things here yet. So, yes, there's a lot of words of affirmation, but there isn't much substance to provide affirmation for. Well, and I think that's that. When do you celebrate, and when do you, you know, roll up your sleeves? And so, there's a little bit of both. So, I don't think you ever get there. You're always working toward it. I think that's our philosophy. Anything further? Is there any community comment on this report? <clears throat> Thank you very much. I think it was under an hour. <laughs> Thank you. Our next item is the superintendent's report, which will begin with a budget update. Dr. Erdl. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, there hasn't been a lot of uh, change since our, our last meeting regarding the, the budget process and from the state state picture. The uh, the only thing that there's been some additional complexity added to it with the budget repair bill and where that is sitting right now. Um, we're continuing to, to work through and, and hope some things get moving a little bit quicker. I think the worst case scenario that we're facing is somewhere between six and seven million dollars of reduction, but the worst case scenario is if the budget bill were to not pass and the budget, budget repair bill did not pass and the budget bill did pass, but I think they're they're tied, and I think most people see that they're tied together because one doesn't necessarily work without the other. Um, we're hoping that there's some resolution. Certainly the budget process is moving through the state rather quickly, and <coughs> they can make some decisions and, and come to some conclusions on that piece, and hopefully the budget repair bill comes to some conclusions as soon as possible so we can continue our planning. Um, we are administratively working through many different scenarios and what it can look like. But again, we're in a waiting game, although the window gets a little bit closer to decision time. We have layoff language that, had, that, is a, that has timelines approaching with June 1st. So we'll continue through the process and continue developing uh, the budget. I think one of the things that has gone somewhat unnoticed, and I think it, for me it was brought to light when I um, found out that State Superintendent Avers had requested or suggested to the joint finance and to the governor that they take a risk and adapt his funding plan regardless of the level of funding and it's several months ago when we had the presentation regarding that plan that's what we stated was our biggest fear that they would adopt this and without the level of funding that he's asking for and I think a major component of that and our concern is still out there and it's not in the budget bill and I think it needs to be addressed because it's it has a negative impact on Wauwatosa, and it's the, uh, the school tax levy credit. And over the past six, seven years, that money's been shifted to the school tax levy uh, credit versus the, the state aid formula. And 
that shift in dollars costs our taxpayers $2.5 million every year. And if we're looking at savings for our taxpayers, I think it's the most critical component that uh, needs to be addressed. And I know um, AEF, which is a funding organization, has recently sent a letter to the, to the legislators about it. And there's been some discussion, but it seems to be hidden somewhat. Um, and, and Wauwatosa, percentage-wise, is one of the largest, or one of the districts hit, hit the largest on the, the levy credit. It doesn't give us more spendable dollars, but I think certainly what's going on is a lot of talk about the taxes and the levy, and that's one way to decrease our levy immediately by two and a half million dollars if that money were shifted back the way it was meant to be within the original funding formula. So, like I said, we'll continue to work through. We continue to have discussions with all of our uh, associations and uh, the, the unions in trying to get prepared for the start of next school year. On the school board elections, the April 5th election results for the Wauwatosa School Board are seat number four, Mary Jo Randall, seat five, Tom DeRose, seat six, Sharon Muehlfeld, and seat seven, Lois Weber. The new board members officially take office on Monday, April 25th. The four members will take the oath of office for a three-year school board term at the meeting on Monday, April 25th. And the new school board officers are elected to the first at the first regularly scheduled meeting in May, and this year that is May 9th. Before we move on to item three, do the board members have any questions or comments with regards to the budget update? Mr. Croner. I, I have a question. If Act 10 is still in litigation and not in, enacted by the time we're required to pass a budget, will we be presenting a budget that complies with the conditions of it not being enacted or a budget that is predicting it will be enacted? In other words, will we, if it's not, if it's still being litigated, will we be passing a budget that takes the full amount of cutting that we would have to take into account? Well, I think there's some discussion about whether we can do something conditional on what the law were to pass. Um, and if not, we have to go with what current law is when we need a budget passed. So if it's, if it's not passed, we need to, we need to look at, um, at, uh, at what, the, what the reductions would be with the budget. But I, I think there's also some talk that the Act 10 language, if not passed through the court system or not, um, put in force in the court system that it's going to be included in the budget bill before the budget passes as well. And they, they've, at least what I've heard is they intend to pass the budget in June this year, which um, would, would be good, but obviously it's still not early enough for us to know everything. But um, I think we'd either have to look at doing something conditional, pending the outcome of Act 10, or based upon the Act 10 not being in place and, and the budget being in place as well. And then modify the budget in the fall? based on the new conditions? Well, when I'm talking conditionally, I'm even saying that we would modify it prior to that time. So we'd have to go back and modify it even before then. I, it's, it's certainly um, it's uncharted territories for, for all of us. I don't think any of us administratively have gone through anything like this. So we're going to rely on some legal advice, and, and uh, I'm not, I don't want to look at guessing, but the best knowledge that we can get from everybody that's dealing with it. All right, thanks. Any other questions or comments? Mrs. Randall? I, um, I appreciate that you are putting information on the website and um, hope that you can continue to do that. And even if it's not update information, if it's just an explanation of school funding, that's one of the fears that I have the most is when you listen to legislators or people who are lobbying for something um, so clearly there are things that they don't understand and so um, I think the more we can educate I mean I you know I still go to John Mack periodically and you know ask I, something I thought I knew how it worked and then I didn't but it, it's so complex and now it's so up in the air but um, if, if you or John could add some type of informative information on the state on the um, school website, uh, I think that would be helpful too. Like when you talk about the school tax levy credit, I know we had a whole presentation from John on it, but otherwise I wouldn't have known about it. So um, 
any real information would be, I think, a real asset to, to getting people involved and concerned. Anything further, board members? Is there any community comment on the budget update or the election results? Seeing none, this brings us to the point of the meeting that I've been dreading all meeting um, because we have to now say goodbye to our colleague, Mr. Ray. Uh, Mr. Ray's been on the school board for uh, six years, and I have to say, I usually go last, but I'm going to go first this time, excuse me. Um, you'll all have your chance in a minute. Um, John came on the board at a very tumultuous time in Wauwatosa and for this district, and there have been um, some stormy times since then and some calm times, but throughout all of those, I believe that John has been a voice of reason on this board, and that will be missed by myself and I think by the board as a whole. Um, his is a voice uh, that always sort of brings us back to what we're really here for, and um, for that, thank you very much, and we will, um, I was going to do this at the end, but we'll do it now. <laughs> we have a plaque for you recognizing your years of service on the board. And I'll just read it. It says, presented to Jonathan M. Ray in recognition of his outstanding service and his dedication to maintaining quality education in the schools of our community. Wauwatosa School District, Wauwatosa, Wisconsin. School Board Member 2005 to 2011. So, John, thank you very much. Thank you. And we will miss you, and I'll miss having you sitting in the chair next to me. <laughs> board members, I would invite anyone who would like to make a comment to John to speak. Go ahead. Mr. Ray, <coughs> for six years, any vote I took was not a responsible vote unless I accounted in my thinking for what you had to say. And um, it was always a learning experience to hear what you thought about any topic. And going forward, I will wish whenever I vote that I could still hear what you had to say. Thank you. Anyone else? Dr. Erdl? You know, when you're, when you're looking at Mr. Anderson's presentation and you look at the top ten list, um, I just went through it as I was looking at it and thinking of, of John Ray. Collaborator, communicator, innovator, all of those things. And we've had the good fortune as a school district to, to do some really good things in the past six years. And um, John's work on the school board has always been in the best interest of our district, best interest of our kids and the employees of the school district. And I know you you didn't hire me, but you got stuck with me on your <laughs> shortly after uh, came on. But I just want to say thank you for your, your work on the board um, and your dedication to our school district. It's been great working with you. And I know we'll continue working together on the legislative committee that you've agreed to uh, be part of. So we'll, we'll keep you engaged in, in what's going on in the school district. And I know you'll want to see the, the uh, the product of a lot of your hard work when it comes later on down the road. Um, well, I promised John that I would be honest tonight. I was trying to decide if it would be funny. <laughs> 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 if we were going to roast him or if we were going to just say goodbye. And so um, I, I, I totally agree um, that your thoughtfulness, um, your um, your demeanor is is very um, calming and reassuring, and if, if there are a lot of things that you could go one way or the other, you know, as much as you've researched it, as many people as you've listened to, you get here, and then we start talking, and it's like yikes. And I, and I do look to John, and um, I, I just I very much appreciate it. And I'm gonna miss you. You're invaluable, John. Not only to the school board, but to this community. You brought with you a wonderful family that we all enjoy. And Dr. Earl has answered a little bit of my concern. We're not going to let you go. We're going to still be able to turn to you. And you know that when I have a question, I hope you won't mind, I will be asking you for direction because your depth of wisdom is so important. So thank you. So, oh, yes, Mrs. Newcomb. John, thank you very much for all your years. Um, I just want you to know how much I respect you as a member of our team, and uh, hopefully you will continue to um, 
speak um, publicly and um, often if there's something that you want to share. Yeah, I also want to thank you. I've learned a lot from watching you operate, uh, the thoughtfulness you put into your questions. And I have to say, as others have mentioned, your calm demeanor and the way you, you are even keeled about the way you go about making decisions. And that's a been useful thing for me to observe and something I try to incorporate. Well, once again, thank you very much. And uh, I don't know what you're going to do with your Monday nights now. <laughs> but if we could all give Mr. Ray a round of applause, please, for his <laughs> We do have one further opportunity for public comment on unagenda items. If there's anyone present who would like to make a comment, please approach the microphone and state your name and address. Seeing none, I believe a motion to adjourn is in order. I would note that the school board will adjourn into executive session pursuant to WISTAT sections 19.85 sub 1, sub E, and C to discuss the status of negotiations with its collective bargaining units, potential changes to health insurance plan impacting those negotiations, and treatment of non-represented employee compensation and benefits for the 2011-12 school year. Is there a motion to adjourn into executive session? So moved. Thank you, Mrs. Muehlfeld. Is there a second? Second. We'll take a roll call vote. Mrs. Galante? Mr. Crowder? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Mrs. Muehlfeld? Yes. Mrs. Randall? Yes. Mr. Ray? Yes. Mrs. Weber? Yes. Mrs. Speed? Yes. We stand adjourned. Kids never checked in here to make sure we got